Without the Holy Spirit of God, we would wander and be lost forever. I'd heard somebody say one time that if I could lose my salvation, I would. Left in our own power and strength, we would. Left in our own power and strength of chasing after Jesus, we would be prone to wander from God. So we certainly have something to thank the Lord over today. We can count our blessings. Remember that song, count our blessings, name them one by one. And we've already had the opportunity to see the hand of the Lord in the act of salvation and then to see the obedience to the Lord by stirring the waters of baptism. What a beautiful picture that was this morning of seeing a person obedient to the Lord following through and believing that Christ Jesus is the Messiah and died for their sins and repented of their sin. And as they believe, they follow through with obedience to the command the Lord left and then to stir the waters of baptism and in the church family to gather around in affirmation, affirming. And church, I got to say, if there's a reason for us to sing to the Lord and worship in His name, it's today. But see, the daunting task comes a little later in the process of actively making decisions. See, the Lord can save, and the Lord does save, and that's easy on behalf of our Lord, like the snap of a finger. The Lord can save a person from their sins. The daunting task that I hope that you've seen visualized was the illustration, not only illustration, but what was in the water of baptism this morning. You have student pastor, Jason, who will walk beside Drew. You have, you have mom and dad represented in the baptism. And then, of course, Drew himself. So the daunting task comes in shaping and actively making disciples. It is not simply by walking an aisle and filling out a card and saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. And those are important things. But the daunting task is now walking together, walking together and actively making disciples. And we sang that song earlier on, praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Because He is worthy of our praise, He is worthy of our worship, He is worthy of our adoration. Jesus is worthy of us getting up early in the morning and coming and assembling in His name. He is worth getting up at the crack of dawn and coming into God's house. He is worthy even if we lose an hour of sleep of coming into His house and worshiping Him. He is worthy of us investing in growing in our knowledge of His divine nature. He is worthy of us growing closer to Him and knowing more about who He is. Westminster Confession of Faith to the Person of Jesus, chapter 8 and article number 1 says these words, that it pleased God in His eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus his only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and men, the prophet, priest, and king, the head head and savior of the church, and heir of all things, and judge of the world, until whom he did for all eternity he give a people to be his seed, to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and then glorified. Church, is He worthy? He is. He is. And you know, as we read God's Word, and as we hear God's Word, preaching and sharing God's Word, I think, should be set on fire by the power of God. Preaching and teaching must be set on fire by the power of God. I, I think it's a horrible thing. It's a discredit and dishonorable to the Lord that anybody would stand in the place of proclamation without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the power of God. So we must be set on fire by the power of God before we preach God's Word, before we teach God's Word. See, a church without firm preaching, a church without foundational preaching, a church without the gospel is like a restaurant that doesn't serve food. It's like a buffet that doesn't have anything laid out before you. 
Speaking on Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Dr. Steve Lawson said this about preaching. He said, get on fire for God and people will come to watch you burn. Don't be the bland leading the bland. So there is a fire and fervor that should be cooking in every single child of God. There should be a fire and a fervor that is cooking and boiling within every child of God because who Christ Jesus is, and then that boiling over ought to boil over onto everybody else. I want to be on fire with the Word of God this morning. I want you to be on fire as you consume the Word of God this morning with a fire and fervor that will boil over onto others around you. Amen. Let's stand together as we read God's Word. Acts chapter 16. I'm going to be reading these five verses for you together. About the midnight, Paul, uh, midnight hour, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to him. Acts 16 verse 26 says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and he saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in with the lights, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said the most important question that he could ask, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Holy Word, and you may be seated. In today's sermon, we pick, off where, we pick up where we left off at last, and hopefully by God's sovereignty and provision this morning, we will finish through Acts 16 and pick up chapter 17 and introduction next week. But we leave off where Paul and Silas were thrown in prison primarily for preaching the gospel of Jesus. This is the primary cause to which they were thrown in prison. But more specifically, Paul, in the power of the Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit fire and fervor, he cast out a demon, a demonic spirit, out of a young servant girl who had been following them along the way, probing and prodding and mocking Paul Mocking the apostles, she followed them along the way and was persistently, continually saying in verse 17 that these men are servants of the Most High, which is true. But then says, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She was misrepresenting what Paul and them were preaching, that there is only one way of salvation. As in his, and his name is Jesus. So she was misrepresenting Paul and his preaching. He got to the point where he was annoyed. And the image is like a rug that is consistently worn out and beat out on the back steps. He was worn out to the place where he got supremely annoyed at this demoniac. And he cast this demon, this unclean spirit, out of her. And because of this, because this demon was cast out, now the owner's way of living, their livelihood, had been taken away. See, they had been using this young demoniac infested girl uh, by way of soothsaying or fortune telling, sleight of hand, deception. They were using this girl and her foresight, if you will, to make a profit. And now that this is taken away, they took Paul and Silas to the city officials, the magistrates, and they tried them primarily for disruption disturbing the peace, which is a major offense in this time. Paul and Silas were then in prison. They were thrown into jail. And this is where we left off last week. And a few points I want you to remember from last week's sermon is, number one, that the enemy will attack God's people, especially when you preach and teach. So just know that the devil is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, going to and fro. It is not give any power or credence to the devil at all. But just so you know, when you preach the gospel truth, the enemy will arise and attack. Just so you know that. But the points I raised last week was simply this, that when the enemy attacks, Jesus is far superior. 
Christ is far superior. In fact, it is no contest at all. As I mentioned, this illustration, and this even pales in comparison to the illustration, it would be like the illustration I used was like a pine straw in in a fist fight with a hurricane. No contest. In fact, in fact, the enemy, Satan, cannot even stand in the shadow of Christ Jesus. So when the enemy attacks, Christ and the power and the victory we have in Jesus is far superior. And then when the enemy attacks, there is safety in Christ Jesus in this life and the next. At least for those who abide in Him. Now for those who do not abide in Christ, what do we expect? Death. We expect the wrath of God. We expect judgment from God for those who do not abide in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now we have approached the text for today in verses 25 through 30. And I will pick up towards the end of this sermon with the rest of these verses. Lord willing, finishing up chapter 16. And we pick up in this prison scene. Paul and Silas are there thrown in this prison. And one would think that they would be down in the dumps trying to figure out what to do next. We probably would, wouldn't we? We would probably be like, Lord, why me? Why did you put us in this situation, O Lord? And and singing the woe is me. And then we peek into the prison scene, and then we find the apostle Paul and Silas. What are they doing? They are singing praises to God. So what would we learn from this prison scene? I hope that we'll learn two things today through this prison scene, if not more things to apply to our lives. So two things I want us to learn. Number one, we must worship the Lord in all situations. In all situations of life. And I would say to you, sometimes, many times, if not all the time, this offering of praise and worship and adoration sometimes comes out of a place of bringing a sacrifice of praise to our Lord. Sometimes, if we are honest with ourselves, we don't feel like getting up after daylight savings time when we lose an hour. And we, sometimes we don't want to get up early. And we push ourselves and we discipline ourselves to get up. Sometimes we don't feel as if we want to come and assemble or even be around people today. But we push through. Why? Because Jesus is worth it. Worship and adoration of the King who saved you is worth, is worth it. And if the Holy Spirit dwells within you, if He is moving and dwelling and living within you, guess what the Holy Spirit will compel you to do? To worship the King of Kings. And what do we find in this place? Instead of the woe is me's, which is, by the way, what we would probably do. The Bible tells us that Paul and Silas, about midnight, were praying and singing. Singing hymns to God. And the prisoners, it says that they were listening in as well. More than likely, they were singing a Davidic psalm. The psalm of David. And praying simultaneously together. Singing and praying together. This would almost be a glimpse of maybe the early charismatic church in this sense. You ever been to a charismatic church and they pray and sing all together and you're like, okay, I'm not in the right place, am I? They'll sing and they'll pray together out loud. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but they are praying and singing together simultaneously. And there may be an indication that because of their stripes, they could have had a difficult time finding rest. They were beaten with rods, remember? They were beaten. So I don't know if you've ever been beat with rods. I remember getting beaten with a switch when I was little. And then it might be hard to take a nap after that. And say so they were beaten with these stripes, and they might have found it a difficult time of resting. Or it may just be, and here's my inclination. This is my thinking. It may just be that they simply knew that they were exactly where God would have them at. They were exactly where God wanted them to be at. In the right place at the right time. And because of that, they were just joyful based on that. You ever been there? You know that you are in the will of God. You're exactly where God wants you to be at. And my friends, there is joy in that. There is joy in knowing exactly where you are and you're standing with God. And they are just, they are just joyful about that. And they're singing. Even though they're bearing stripes and behind bars, they are happy. Have you ever been Have you ever been happy and joyful even when the world seems crumbling around you because you simply, you know that Jesus lives and that Jesus saved you? So instead of singing the blues, we ought to be singing praises to God. And that's what they were doing. 
But more importantly than singing praises to God, why is it important in this situation of life that they find themselves in? Why is it important to praise God in all situations? It is important because people were listening. You see that? A few weeks ago, I stated that it is important what people think of you or how they perceive you, and it is important. And we don't live like the world anymore. We, we don't care what people think. We don't care if we got drunk last weekend or whatever. I don't care what people think. But as we go from death into life, into the kingdom of God, our walk is different. Our perception of life is different now. It is important. And here's a good indication why this train of thought is so important. Because people are watching and people are listening Especially if you claim to be a follower of Christ. As soon as you drop those words that you believe in Jesus, you automatically find yourself under the watching eye of the world. Number one, they want to investigate to see if it's true. And then number two, they want to watch and see if you actually live it out. So here's Paul and Silas. They're singing, they're praying, they're singing praises simultaneously. They're blending together their petitions of praise and worship as if they knew Jesus' model prayer. It said, Our Father who art in heaven, what they say? Hallowed be thy name, affirming God's holiness. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he says what? Give us this day. A petition. They understood something about Jesus' model prayer. But more amazing than that is this. It is amazing how hopeful the early church seemed to be. How hopeful the church is. All through the book of Acts, there's a, a joyful, there's a praise in all situations that they offer before the Lord. Even when situations look dire, such, it is, such as it is here. It's amazing how the early church seemed to be. I think we can learn something from them there. And then because of their praying and their praising to God and they're singing. The Bible says in verse 26 that it was a great earthquake that came and the foundations of the prison were shaken out of place. The doors were open and the, and the stocks fell off, their, their wrists and ankles, it fell off and they were freed. The Lord responded to this praise and preaching by sending an earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. I want you to make no mistake about this. This is the hand of the Lord that caused this earthquake earthquake. The prison bar bonds broke. It was more than just God's, the symbol of the Lord's presence. You might read a commentator that would say it's the symbol of God's presence. No, it was God. God's presence was with them. Not just a, not just a symbol that he was with them. Because we often forget that Paul and Silas are fervently praying. They, they are praying as if they are, they are caught on fire by the word of God. And it's boiling over. And so they are fervently praising the living, risen Christ. And then this happens. And there must be something to this message that they are preaching. God is adding His stamp of authenticity to this by sending this, this earthquake, shaking the foundation, freeing the stocks, freeing the prisoners. The jailer woke up and he saw the prison doors were open. He drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights. Bring the lights in. They bring the lights in, shone, shone on Paul and Silas. He's trembling. He's fallen down before Paul and, and Silas. And then he asked this most important question, probably the most important question he'll ever ask. In fact, it was probably the most important question that we have ever asked in our life is, what must I do to be saved? I want you to listen. It might seem that Paul and company are rescued from this jail, and they are physically, they are rescued. But the main prison break was this jailer and then his household. In case we haven't figured this out yet, this is a snippet of this Macedonian cry for help. Here's a man crying out, help us. What must I do to be saved? This Macedonian cry for help in this episode was for the rescue of this Philippian jailer from what? From his sin. 
and everyone's bonds were open, and the heart of the jailer will be opened to the power of the gospel. And what is more amazing than this, I think, or at least amazing in its own right, is that all the prisoners didn't come and run out of the jail cell. It tells me that the gospel message is compelling. It tells me that there's something compelling about the good news. See, without the good news of Jesus, the jailer might as well fall on his sword. Without the good news of Christ and salvation through Christ, life is absurd, life is meaningless, and life is hopeless, which is what every existential philosopher will tell you, that this life is absurd, it is without meaning, and it is hopeless. And it is hopeless without Jesus, friends. You might as well fall on the sword. The jailer was getting ready to take his own life. He was in charge of all of these prisoners and all of them escaping would surely cost his life and he just wanted to end it all. Paul calls out to him, being the evangelist here, being the apostle, he says, hold on, don't harm yourself, we are here. Now Paul is a Roman citizen, something that will come up later at the end of this chapter. And he knew what would happen to this seemingly negligent guard. He knew that this man would probably lose his life if all of the prisoners escaped on his watch. So the guard called for light. He fell at the foot of the apostles and he asked this important question, what must I do to be saved? And the motive of this question, I think, is actually twofold. The motive of this question is actually twofold. He was seeking, number one, how he might be saved considering his current negligence in his guardianship. He failed as a guardian. He failed at a, as a warden. He failed as a prison guard. What must I do to get out of this? But secondly and most importantly, he had to have overheard them singing praises to God. Even though he woke up at the earthquake, the Bible says that they were continually and simultaneously singing praises to God. They didn't say, wait, the jailer is asleep now. Let's sing. So no doubt this guard, this guard had overheard the singing of praises to God and saw something there in the joy that they had and then tell me what you were singing and praying about. Tell me, who is this man Jesus that you are singing about? And what must I do to be saved? And it is amazing to me what just a little commitment to Christ can stir up within another person. And in all actuality, just being obedient, just displaying genuine faith can go a long way when we are witnessing Christ to others. But tell me this. Would the watching world do well to see a happy, joyful follower of Jesus who knows God's Word, who is in God's Word, who knows how to share their faith, who knows what it means to be a follower of Christ, who is following happily and joyfully and closely, do you think the world, the watching world, would do well to hear that? Or to hear one who, who is upset about everything in life and complaining about everything in life and wants the world to know it? So think about this. Who is actually preaching more to the watching world? Is it actually those who are in Christ or those who complain all the time? What is the world hearing? Are they hearing a good news message or a message of cynicism, complaining, and, and just divisiveness? What would the watching world, you think, rather do well to hear? A child of God who is happy, joyful, worshipful, and values community. Paul and Silas, see, they had every reason to complain about their situation, but they had more reason to sing praise to Jesus. And in doing so, they caught the ear of somebody listening. Not to mention that this earthquake scared this guard out of his skin, as it would me too. So we've got to learn the discipline. Yes, the discipline. The discipline. If the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray, no doubt we also have to learn something about praising God in and through the storm. So there is a discipline of praising Jesus through the storm and in the storm. Because of their outlook upon their faith, 
and praising God, they stirred up this question, now what must I do to be saved? I've only had this happen one time in my whole ministry. When somebody said, what must I do to be saved? How can I be a Christian? I've only had this happen one time in my ministry. But I've got to tell you this, every time, not only one time, but every time a person would ask this question, it is always when Jesus has been exalted. It is always when Christ has been lifted up and we lay bare before Him. We have nothing to bring to Christ except for our sins and we give them to Him. We have nothing to bring to Jesus but ourselves. So it is always when Christ is exalted and our self is laid bare before Him. So not only do we find that worshiping Christ is to be done in all situations of life, we also learn something about Spirit-led worship. And what we see in this episode as we look into this Philippian jail is that Spirit-led worship is always gospel-centric. Spirit-led worship is gospel-centric. If anything leads a person away from the the work of the Lord Jesus, that's not worship. If you go to a church service and Jesus is not mentioned, and Jesus is not exalted, that's not worship. Friends, that's a club meeting. That's that's just a a gathering of of people. That that is not worship at all. If Jesus is not elevated, if Jesus is not preached, if Christ is not exalted, if repentance is not mentioned, if my sins is not mentioned, if the love of Christ is not mentioned in conjunction with those sins, that's not worship. Spirit-led worship is gospel-centric. It is Christ-centric. It is not man-centered. But look what transpires when the gospel is preached and is lived out. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your house. So the question is, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We we find this question asked, what must I do to be saved? We find it in Matthew 19, verse 16. For those who might want to write that down. Matthew 19, verse 16. We find it in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. We find it in Luke 18 and verse 18. And then we also find it in this chapter in verse 30, which I've just just read before. Now Paul was speaking more than just escaping the judgment of of a Roman set of magistrates. He's talking about salvation of the soul. And this is the same truth that Peter preached to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. So do you really think that it's it's not really important what church a person goes to. I have heard people say that. It doesn't matter what church you go to. That goes right back, circles right back to what I just said earlier. If that church is not exalting Jesus, if they're not preaching Jesus, if they're not preaching that there is no other name under heaven which men might be saved in the name of Jesus, that's not church. If they're preaching any works-based salvation, that's not church. So it is important the church that a person goes to to attend and listen to God's Word, do you think that it is important that we learn key doctrines and teaching? Yes. And why do I bring that up? Well, I bring this up because of Peter and Paul and the transaction that happened between them two. It is important. I want you to, to again, think about Peter and Paul in this, in this way, that the gospel was passed down from Peter and to, and to Paul And the proof is in the message. Because Peter said to Cornelius in chapter 10 of verse 43, Tell to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of their sins through his name, the name of Jesus. And then Paul says, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And then he adds the addendum, you and your household. So this is the gospel message in its simplest form. The message didn't have to have, raise your hand if you receive Christ. 
It didn't have to be bow your head and, and close your eyes, every head bowed, every eye closed across the sanctuary. The message didn't need to have a fog machine on the stage. It didn't have to have flash pots and lights shining all over. It didn't need to have a young hip pastor in skinny jeans sitting at a table sharing his thoughts. It needed just the simple answer to the question that Jesus saved. Believe or trust in the Savior Messiah as Jesus and His work on the cross and you will be saved. Sometimes we need to get our baggage out of the way so that the gospel can go up and forward and preeminent. He rose again and He's returning again. But not only that, we have enough faith in Jesus as Lord that your household will fall under the conviction and be saved as well. Now, notice what Paul didn't say. He didn't say, all you've got to do is you've got to walk this aisle, you've got to fill out a card. He, he didn't even say this, okay? He didn't even say that you need to be baptized right now in order to make this thing stick. He said, what? Believe. And Paul and Silas began to preach to him. He spoke the word of the Lord. And all who were in his house in that same hour, at night, they washed their wounds and he was baptized at once. He and his family, they believed, they attended and loved on him, and then they were baptized, he and his family. Then he brought them into the house to set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. What a total opposite, what a total clashing of worldviews that we see here when Lydia and now this jailer are sharing their resources with, with Paul and Silas and company, and they are rejoicing in Jesus. And just a few moments earlier, they are arrested for actually liberating a young girl with a demon. What a clashing of worldviews. What polar opposites. The jailer's sins had been set free and the burden of sin and the sting of death has now been resolved through the blood of Christ, through the blood of the Lamb. Spirit-led worship will always lead to an exaltation of Jesus and will always, without fail, it will lead a regenerate follower. That means somebody who has been saved. It will always lead a follower of Jesus to walk a little bit closer to their Lord. So this worship service is led by Paul and Silas, overpowering. The prison walls shook. Imagine being in that type of, of setting where we sing so loud that the volume doesn't matter. Where we sing so loud with our voices and we raise the, raise the roof off. And the volume of their voices drowned out the cares of everything else. But I think that we probably think that we're too sophisticated to sing this way. Or that we can't sing at all. As a pastor, do you think I care whether or not you can carry a tune in a bucket? Now, we all got the opportunity to go to the East Coast Men's Bible Conference. There's about 12 of us who went. And I had a lot of time to, to think about these scriptures on the road. About 45 minutes, 50 minutes there, 50 minutes back. And I went over this question in my head and contemplated this. And Friday night we go and we're singing there with 12, 1,200 men, at least 1,200 men, singing praises to God. And I remember thinking about this, this question, do you think that I really, do I, you think I care if you can carry a tune in a bucket? I don't care if your heart is in tune with God. And we're singing the song, In Christ Alone. Men are raising their voices, they're singing to the Lord, and it's doing my heart good. And then all of a sudden, a man behind me, in the most robotic sounding voice I've ever heard in my life, the most out of tune voice I think I have ever heard in a church service, began to sing behind me, in Christ alone, my hope is found. And I've got to tell you, in that moment, I thought to myself, Lord, is this a test? I don't know that gentleman. I don't know who he is. I didn't even reach back and introduce myself. Hey, I introduced myself. I heard you can't sing. <laughs> but let me tell you what. His heart was in tune with the Lord. 
Do you think the Lord cares if your voice is out of tune when your heart is in tune with Him? You might hear somebody say, I don't sing because I can't sing. You think the Lord cares? One day we'll be able to sing in perfect harmony and perfect pitch. But more importantly, the jailer hears the hymns and prayer to the point where he believes in Jesus. Not only that, they rejoiced together and they celebrated salvation. They actually celebrated. We celebrated this morning. And I hope you guys will continue to celebrate. They celebrated Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that this was more than just lip service? How do we know this is more than just filling out a card and putting it in the offering plate and saying, I, I want to accept Christ today? How do we know it was more than that? Well, he was hungry to know more about Jesus and to grow in his newfound faith. We see this in verse 32. He was hungry. He wanted his family to hear this message. They heard the message. His faith produced a genuine love, and that was shown unto the apostles. He was attending their, their wounds. He has a peace and a joy in believing and made an open profession of faith as he was baptized. You know how dangerous it was for a person, and is even today, for a person to proclaim Jesus and to be baptized? That's why they were baptized immediately, out of necessity and out of this public procl proclamation. You say you believe Jesus? Let's be baptized now. Let's put the proof in the pudding. Not only is the worship of King Jesus essential in all situations, and not only is it spirit-led worship that is gospel-centric, but also move one to seek to be blameless before others. Look at these last verses. The magistrate sent the police, said, let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. We don't know exactly why the magistrates wanted to set them free. It could be that the Lord put it in their heart, put it in their mind. It could be that they found out that they were Roman citizens and wanted to get out of a bad situation and send them out of town so that they would not lose their positions. If you remember, the town people accused them of being Hebrew or Jewish did not even think about them being Roman citizens. It found out that they were Roman citizens. The magistrates could lose their position if Rome found out. So they charged these as Roman citizens, unlawful. So again, do you think that it is important to have a good reputation? Here's how Paul would respond to that. The Bible says that they wanted to bring them out and set them free, but Paul says they have beaten us publicly, they have uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, they have thrown us into prison, and now they want to throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The, re the police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Now we certainly want to get them out of town. So they apologized to them, and they took them out, and they asked them to leave the city. And so they went out of the prison, but on the way out, they visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them, and then they departed. Now, this interaction, I think, is full of irony, because now the magistrates who condemned Paul and Silas are actually the ones who are offenders of the law. And Paul and Silas are set free, and they're innocent. But remember, a good example that Paul leaves is to make sure that every move that he makes has a gospel initiative. He was not going to leave that area he was not going to leave that area with the stain of breaking the law. And that everything is to give avenue to the glory of God, even leaving Philippi with a good and intact reputation. Everything was for the furtherance of the gospel. To leave with a good reputation, staying true to Christ and giving Him praise and worship through the storm brought them to this place. So my words of encouragement are stay true to Christ through it all. Worship Him because we have something to worship about and over. Paul and Silas were sent to answer this Macedonian call for help. They came, they shared the gospel. The jailer and his house were saved, and Lydia and her house were saved. And on the way out, Paul and Silas, they revisited Lydia's house and set up a foundation for a, for a home or house church, a place of worship. In closing, is your house a place of worship? Is your heart one which harbors praise and worship? to Jesus 
in spite of situations in life, as you lift up Christ with rightful adoration, it will incline people to put in an ear and listen and pay attention. But we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In closing, just this few minutes, I want to share, not scripted, not written down, none of that. I want to share with you, in closing, a dream that I had, not before last. Ironically enough, I was arrested. I was in jail. And I was arrested simply on being a pastor and a preacher of the gospel. And I remember how uncomfortable it was, even in my dream, being in handcuffs. Being in jail. And my first thought was, is my family okay? Are they okay? That was my first thought. And my second thought was this. To my own shame, even in my dream, my thought was this. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to take care of my family? As vivid as a dream as I ever had. Now, had the Lord put that in my head? I don't know. Maybe he did. But I do know this. I learned something from that. That instead of singing and praising God and exalting Jesus in prison, even even though it was in my dream, I complained and moaned and groaned and was uncomfortable in that situation. And I think these words are so true. That no matter where we are, we don't know what it means to be in jail, but I think I got a little bit of that feeling in that dream. How uncomfortable it was. And that is how most of our life is. Sometimes we get in uncomfortable places and we look for that road out. And we want that quick and easy, quick resolve. But that is when, in those situations, that is when we praise God and worship Him all the more. Amen. Let's pray together.